Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Veronica Magda. So she, she was born in Germany. She studied biotechnology at the TU Brauns, Braunschweig uh, on chemical engineering at the, chemical, uh, at the University of Waterloo, Canada. Um, so I'm very happy always to say that then uh, she was my, my first PhD and, and it's so nice to see her uh, brilliant development and how her career progresses so so nicely over the next years having many many awards and recognitions like first she got the phd in in biology at the 2016 at dresden uh working on pioneer work of biohybrid micro robot that she will be so a little bit talking about today and that was done at the institute of bioengineering um, for integrative nanoscience at the Lyman Institute uh, in Dresden. So, and then from 2017 to 2020, she um, got an open topic postdoc at the chair of applied zoology, where she conducted metabolic and kinetic studies on sperms of various species. And that was at the TU Dresden as well. And then besides continue her research on sperm hybrid microbots. Then in 2020, she was awarded with a further note La Linen Fellowship from the Alexander Mohumbold Foundation uh, to join our group, uh, Smart Nanobio Devices, here in IBEC. And also, uh, I think it's very impressive after this award that she was uh, awarded with the Lakasha Junior Leader Fellowship uh, to work on a project, uh, Flexible Flagellated, Flagellated Magnetic Robots. So the talk will be uh, right now for 45 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please write your questions in the chat. And if we have time enough, of course, you can open your mic later on and we have more interactive uh, discussion. So now my pleasure to give the floor to Veronica. Please enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Uh, and today I want to take you through, through my journey uh, of developing biohybrid and bio-inspired micro-robots towards biomedical applications. Okay, I see that the slides are not responding, so I have to wait a second. Okay, let's start again. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, Samuel, for the for the introduction. I don't have to say anything more uh, about uh, my CV to uh, to introduce my my topic and my background. So we're going to jump right in into micro nanorobotics, uh, and this is basically the field I've been working in for the last few years. And um, you might you might know this famous lecture from Richard Feynman that uh, we always refer to that he held in 1959, where he drew this picture of miniaturization and this picture of the use of micro nanorobots to be able to um, have biomedical applications completely non-invasive and highly targeted. Uh, and now, six years later, we have the know-how and we have the technology to start making this vision come true. But what uh, do we actually mean when we say micro-robots or nano-robots? Um, the requirements for such robots are that uh, they have to show autonomous motion. So uh, they have to have some sort of onboard power source. We need to be able to remotely control their motion to have this precise targeting. And of course, it's also only a robot if it can perform certain tasks. And these tasks, we are targeting our drug and cell delivery, our manipulation of cells, minimal invasive surgery, sensing and di diagnostics, uh, and also environmental remediation. So, and in, in since this lecture of Feynman in, in 1959, uh, researchers have tried to, um, to develop uh, more and more targeted drug carriers. So first we, we started with passive carriers such as liposomes or magnetic nanoparticles that were approved in the 60s and 70s. And then um, they became more targeted. So then we have, for example, targeted liposomes in the 80s and in the 90s, we have the liposomal uh, doxorubicin approved by the FDA. But the emergence of microrobots really started after 2000. And uh, since then we have uh, seen many approaches to develop magnetically controlled bacteria, for instance, or use biohybrid approaches. Uh, the same with the sperm bots that I'm gonna be talking about today. 
but also artificial approaches like bio-inspired helical magnetic robots or uh, other propulsion mechanisms for micro nano robots. So in general, the propulsion mechanisms that have been demonstrated for micro robots are, for example, light-based or by the use of ultrasound or magnetic fields, electrical fields, or also due to um, some gradients that are produced on the surface of Janus particles that uh, lead to the propulsion of these particles. We can also use bubble propulsion by the expulsion of, of bubbles from a microtube um, or uh, cell-based propulsion, for example, by the use of sperm cells, algae, or bacteria. And specifically, the ones I will introduce to you today, the ones I've been working with over the last few years, are catalytic microjets, sperm-driven robots, biomimetic swimmers, and sperm-templated sperm templated, uh, microrobots. So these catalytic microjets, uh, um, Samuel was working with when I joined his group in 2012, so there we have these micro jets, which are basically microtubes or nanotubes that have a platinum surface on the inside. And when they are immersed in diluted hydrogen peroxide, they start propelling very fast due to the catalysis on a platinum surface, which leads to the production of, of oxygen. And this process is very fast so that we can get this jet motion. So um, with some colleagues, we started exploring also these microjets for the degradation of organic pollutants. And one thing we did here was um, that we took advantage of the Fenton reaction. The Fenton reaction is a reaction where iron ions, which for example are released from the iron membrane on the outside of these microtubes. And when these react with peroxide, they form iron-3 ions, but also hydroxyl radicals. And these radicals are very helpful to degrade organic pollutants, for example, rhodamine or other organic pollutants, and convert them into oxidized, oxidized byproducts, which are much less harmful. And not only this degradation is happening uh, with the help of these microtubes, but the mixing effect due to this fast motion of the jets really increases the, the reaction rate and the, uh, the time of, um, that it takes to well, it, it decreases the time that it needs to degrade these uh, organic pollutants. Um, we also developed a way to control the speed of these microjets by the use of NIPAM. NIPAM is this poly and isopropyl acrylamide. This is a type of thermoresponsive polymer. This one you will see uh, throughout a couple of times uh, throughout the seminar. Um, so we used a layer of this uh, and incorporated it into the, this nanomembrane sheet together with polycarpolactone, a passive polymer, and then on the inside again we have the platinum. And then we can uh, use the temperature to, ch to change the shape of these uh, microtubes, so basically opening them up or closing them again. And this changes uh, the speed of these jets because the cavity really determines how fast these, um, these bubbles are propelled, uh, are expelled from the microtube, and thereby we can use it reversibly to speed these jets up, or also to slow them down as we open up this microtube again. And you will see here that this microtube will um, stop moving once it's opening up. So then uh, the next uh, approach that I will just uh, very briefly show to you what you could also do to create motion on the microscale is to use biomimetic motion. So here you see a structure that mimics a jellyfish, but it's completely artificial. So we, here again, we have this thermoresponsive uh, nipon polymer, and we apply temperature cycles, which leads to this asymmetric swelling and contracting thereby uh, leads to a forward motion of this uh, microswimmer. Now, the next approach uh, is mostly about biohybrid microrobots. And why do we develop biohybrid microrobots? Um, biohybrid, first of all, means a combination of biological components and artificial components. And these biological components are especially uh, useful for us because Biological cells have evolved to operate very efficiently on the microscale. 
uh, when you look at sperm cells or bacteria, they can move very fast on the microscale. They also have amazing sensing and taxes abilities that are often hard to, to reconstruct with artificial uh, mechanisms. For example, they can sense uh, temperature gradients, chemical gradients, fluid flow, and many other things. The cells are also very well adapted to the environment of the biomedical applications that we are targeting, such as high viscosity or the interaction with tissue and other cells. And some cells can even self-repair. Now we combine this with the artificial components which bring us further functionality through the choice of material. For example, if we incorporate some magnetic components, this allows us magnetic control uh, or through the geometry or topography, we can um, aim for certain functionalities or features. Some of the first examples of these biohybrid propulsion uh, mechanisms was uh, demonstrated by enzymes. Here, for example, by Monta Magnus group in, in Science 2000. They isolated this ATPase, which is an enzyme complex, which creates this rotating motion, and then attached a nickel, uh, nickel rod to it and showed that we can have this rotating device that is a biohybrid um, device. Then another uh, one of the first examples was to use the catalase enzyme on the inside of these microtubes. This was also demonstrated with, by Summers group and um, this paved the way for many different kinds of enzyme driven nanomotors which are now um, the focus in Summers group as well. Here for example, uh, yeah, not only catalase but also urease or glucose oxidase based propulsion. Another approach of biohybrid propulsion um, is by the use of muscle cells. So what you see here on the left is a PDMS strip um, and along this strip cardiomyocytes were cultured. These are beating heart cells. And you can see how uh, an actuation is created by the use of these cells. And further on, you can uh, use skeletal muscle cells as also is being done in our group by, uh, led by Maria Gish. Uh, where we can integrate the skeletal muscle cells and use electrical stimulation to uh, have a really control, controlled motion of these um, biobots. Uh, and of course, you can use bacteria to propel, um, especially magnetotactic bacteria are interesting here for biomedical applications because you can control them by the use of an MRI. And one, uh, one of the examples uh, of these bacteria-driven micro-robots were these drug-loaded, um, these magnetotactic bacteria that were coated with drug-loaded liposomes. And not only could they be controlled with magnetic fields if they were, once they were injected in the mouse, but also once they were in the vicinity of the tumor, they were uh, attracted to um, the oxygen-poor regions of the tumor by aerotaxis of the bacteria. So they're, they're making use of one of these sensing or taxis abilities of the cells. So uh, I've, I've worked with uh, sperm cells as propulsion source for microrobots. This is what I did to do my PhD. The reason why uh, we chose sperm cells is not only that they have a very strong propulsion source, but also they, they can carry information and uh, we actually also um, demonstrated that we can load them with drugs and that this doesn't um, influence their motility too much so that they can be used as drug carriers. They can also be the cargo when we think about applications for assisted fertilization. They are also very smart sensors. They can sense molecules down to very, very low concentration and redirect their motion accordingly. And they're very well adapted to physiological environments, especially to some in the reproductive tracts. Uh, and these cells show this intrinsic flexibility, which is also unique. Um, and we can learn from for, for developing soft and flexible robots. So what I did was um, we fabricated these, um, these microtubes by the use of Rodeup nanotechnology at the IFW in Dresden. And this uh, technology was previously developed by Oliver Schmidt in this group, but we tuned and tailored the size of these microtubes to fit single sperm cells. 
And that's what you can see here is that the bull sperm is entering this microtube and starts pushing these, um, these microtubes forward. So they have a strong propulsion source. And then we can use external magnetic fields, very weak, just a few millitesla, to guide them to our target location. And here, for example, with the help of robotics, uh, the surgical robotics lab in Twente, we developed this closed loop control where we can simply define a target location. And by the help of image recognition, the robot will be guided to this target location and then kept at this location until we define uh, a new target. Also, this can be used to um, separate um, low motility sperm from high motility sperm because uh, what's happening is if you mix uh, sperm cells with these microtubes, the fast one, the fast sperms that are captured in the microtubes, we can easily move into a separate chamber and use that for, for selection purpose. Another um, interesting thing is that sperm cells can um, stand quite a range of temperature so between well in in the case of bull sperm between 5 and, and 38 or 40 degrees and we can use this temperature effect to uh, to control the speed of the micro robots you can see that the trajectory of at 12 degrees is much shorter than at 37 degrees for the same amount of time then we wanted to find a way to release the cells again from uh, the microtube, which is especially important for the sperm delivery purpose in, in the case of assisted reproduction. For that, we made use of this NIPAM again, this polyen isopropyl acrylamide. And um, here to explain you a bit more what's happening at low temperature, uh, below the LCST, so below the critical solution temperature, this polymer is really swollen and takes up a lot of water because it's a hydrogel. And then above this temperature, it collapses very abruptly. And that's what you can see here also when we, uh, so when we have these patterned uh, circular structures of the polymer and we apply the temperature cycling, they can greatly uh, change the volume. And this can be reversed many times. Now we add a passive layer on top of these circles, and then we can uh, get this uh, rolling effect in which um, the polymeric layers, sorry, it's not playing anymore, in which these polymeric layers start ro rolling into microtubes and this can be used to capture sperm cells and then release them again. Another thing we did was to tune the, the swelling temperature to 37 degrees by adding some comonomers in the polymer solution. And then finally, we can use this to capture sperm cells and release them up on demand if we slightly increase the temperature. Another thing we tested was the motion of these micro robots in real body fluids. In this case, we use bovine oviduct fluid, which we extracted from, uh, from oviducts from the slaughterhouse. And we could see that um, they are still able to move through this fluid, which is much, much more viscous than the standard medium that we usually use in the lab for, for treating sperm cells. So it's very promising for also using these micro robots in biomedical scenarios. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, also sperm cells can be loaded with drugs um, and they can be, in this case here, we used a 3D printed structure that captured the sperm cells and then uh, was loaded with doxorubicin, a cancer um, medicine. And then uh, when these 3D printed structures driven by the sperm cells were guided to a cancer spheroid, we could use this mechanical trigger of opening these four arms in front of this uh, structure to release the sperm cell. And the sperm cell could then uh, fuse with the spheroid and over time release the cancer drug here. This again was done at IFW in Dresden, uh, mostly by Hai Peng Chu, one of the PhD students there. Um, 
then during my time as at uh, as open topic postdoc at the University uh, of Dresden, I started using gelatin structures um, for for these sperm driven robots. Why gelatin? Because and not only it's biocompatible and biodegradable, but it's also pH responsive, which is a nice feature to use for uh, on demand drug release. It can also load a good amount of drugs. And it has also antioxidant properties due to the peptides uh, it's containing. So the pH triggered uh, release is interesting, and I explored this for, for pH triggered sperm manipulation. What I mean by that is um, when sperm cells travel through the reproductive tract, they have to swim through a, quite a wide range of pH. So for example, in the vagina, we have a pH of about five, in the uterus, it's a six to seven, and at the fertilization site in the, in the oviduct, it's a seven to eight. So what I did was uh, at pH five, I loaded these uh, gelatin cartridges or gelatin microstructures with heparin. This heparin is a protein that um, helps mature the sperm cells. Uh, what's important to know is um, not every sperm cell is ready to fertilize and you have to trigger, uh, especially in, in vitro, you have to trigger some sperm maturation that leads to the capacitation uh, and that helps the sperm cells to get ready for fertilization. So I loaded this uh, heparin, this activating agent, onto these gelatin structures. Then I capture sperm cells in these microstructures. And uh, as we change the pH to eight, the heparin is released in the, in the local vicinity of these sperm cells, and we can achieve in situ sperm capacitation, which means that um, we can see an increased speed of these heparin loaded sperm bots compared to the ones that don't contain the heparin. But also we can look uh, more on a molecular level or biochemical level um, the, what the capacitation of the, of the sperm cells look like. So what's the maturation state of the cells? And there we can see that um, if we have the control without heparin, we have a lower amount of capacitated, meaning uh, activated cells, which is shown here in blue. If we increase, if we put uh, heparin directly into the solution with the sperm cells, we can achieve this capacitation uh, of the cells. But also if we want to have this on demand and locally, uh, as I, I demonstrated with these heparin, heparin loaded gelatin structures, we can have this increased capacitation at pH eight when heparin is released from the structures. The other effect that I investigated uh, with these gelatin structures is this uh, protection against oxidative stress. As you might know, um, sperm cells are very uh, sensitive to oxidative stress and it leads to DNA damage. And this oxidative stress comes uh, not only from the environment, but also from the cells themselves. So during their oxidative phosphorylation, do they, do, during their metabolic activity, uh, some of this peroxide is uh, being produced and can harm the cells. So what's happening if we have these antioxidant uh, properties of the gelatin is that the peroxide is, uh, well, it's usually converted to hydroxyl radicals and these radicals are scavenged by the gelatin uh, or these peptides in the gelatin and are converted to oxygen and water to, to make them less harmful. So I investigated this effect on the sperm cells. First of all, we checked the reduction of hydrogen peroxide by the presence of gelatin, which we can see here, this, this uh, concentration of peroxide is greatly reduced. But also the sperm cells themselves, they provide a certain per, um, peroxide concentration, which is then again greatly reduced when we have these um, microstructures present to capture the cells and to protect them from the oxidative stress. And finally, we looked at the enzymatic degradation of these certain structures and uh, we used physiological levels of trypsin and we were able to degrade these structures uh, over a range of 10 to 14 days 
when um, they were completely dissolved. Um, the last type of microbots that I will uh, show to you today are these biotemplated microbots. People have uh, looked at nature and, and used structures from nature as templates for microbots uh, in different ways. First of all, from plants. For example, here they use these calcified microtubes and loaded them with cancer drugs and then used them as, as drillers into cells to, de to deliver these uh, cancer drugs. Also, you can find helical vessel from plants that have this nice feature to serve as template for magnetic robots once they are coated with magnetic uh, material. And the same with these uh, microalgae, the spirulina, which have these helical structures, are then coated with magnetic material and can then be actuated in a rotating magnetic field. So uh, we were looking at the, the self-assembly of sperm cells with magnetic particles, and we saw that especially uh, the bovine sperm cells, which have a negative uh, surface charge, easily self-assemble with positively charged nanoparticles due to electrostatic interaction. And then we get these iron sperm, which are basically dead sperm cells, so they're not motile anymore, but they are coated with these magnetic particles. So what we can do then is we, um, we take these samples and put them into our control system. This again was in Twente at our collaboration partner uh, at the surgical robotics lab. And they have many different types of magnetic control setups. In this case, we have these three pairs of electromagnetic coils that can create a 3D rotating magnetic field. And when we um, put our iron sperm into the system, we can see how they are start moving in a, in a flexible way. And as we increase the frequency, we can start them seeing them move forward. Um, but we also saw a huge variety between the different uh, iron sperm. So we started uh, categorizing them uh, according to these uh, morphological segments of the cell. In case of the sperm cell, you have uh, very distinct segments of the head, the midpiece, the principal piece, and the distal end. And each of them have a specific stiffness. And depending on where the, most of the nanoparticles are bound, we get different behavior in the magnetic field. So we started categorizing them, for example, um, here yeah, in 15 groups, basically, depending on which of the four segments is coated with magnetic particles. And then uh, we can start observing all of them here, for example, all the cases where we have just one magnetic segment. And you can already see such a different response to the same magnetic field. Then when we have two magnetic segments, again, we get different response. Or when we have three magnetic segments, or when we have four magnetic segments, and then compared to our free sperm cell, um, we, can, yeah, we can analyze them in detail, and we get different frequency responses. So basically, we record the motion as we increase the frequency of the magnetic field, and look at the uh, maximum velocities and the step out frequencies. Um, so in principle, we can, um, so this is a very detailed um, analysis that I will not explain here, but in principle, we observe that in cases where we have two different magnetic se segments on a flexible filament, we get this counterproductive action and that uh, the robots that have a larger magnetic um, segment are uh, moving better in the magnetic field. Then we also did a study where we compared uh, free bovine sperm cell that is moving actively, so this is our live sperm cell, and compare that to a magnetically actuated sperm cell that has the magnetic segment only on a head, so that the tail is moving freely. And we can uh, look at that in detail, look at the waveforms, uh, and also use the resistive force theory to give us information about the force that is generated 
from the live cell compared to the magnetically actuated cell. And we can see that the live cell is able to generate much larger force due to the molecular motors that are situated along the whole tail and uh, are creating a different motion mechanism that than we can achieve with the magnetic actuation. So there's still a lot to learn from, from the real swimmers, from the live cells, uh, that we can make use of in microrobotics. Now towards biomedical applications here, just uh, short information, uh, what we tried so far is to load uh, drugs into these um, iron sperm, into these magnetically actuated cells and they can retain the drug very well. We can also use these iron sperms for ultrasound imaging because due to the addition of the magnetic particles we can achieve much increased echogenicity of the cells and thereby we can use ultrasound to locate um, swarms of these. Now, in general, the challenges and concerns we are facing microbots are in microbotics are the imaging, because with the current medical imaging modalities, we are really getting down to, uh, to, to a limit in terms of resolution and also depth to be able to um, track and uh, localize these microbots in vivo. But biocompatibility is also a big question. So, for example, what happens after the use of the ro robots? Do we need to remove them or can we degrade them or resorb them in place? And what about nanosized particles? Where do they accumulate in the body or how are they uh, clear from the body? Another um, question I often get is about the immune response. And this is uh, still completely open field that we don't know exactly how the body uh, responds to those. Um, the motion in complex environments is a big target in the, in the field at the moment because in a, in a petri dish and aqua solution it might be easy to move something but in vivo there's plenty of cells, there are many obstacles, biological barriers, uh, high viscosity that we need to test our micro robots in. Uh, another big uh, topic is swarming. So we know that one microwatt will not be able to accomplish much. So we need to be able to control hundreds or even thousands of them and even have them interact with each other. On the other side, the individual control might be interesting as well because in the end we want to be able to um, have robots perform different tasks simultaneously. So we have to be able to control them individually. And then, of course, there are some more practical questions of the storage, the lifetime, um, and, and cost of such robots for biomedical applications. So, um, at the end here, I want to just uh, draw my research focus that I have for the next few years. On the one, on the one side, I have um, developing micro-robotic tools for therapy, where I'm focusing on the autonomous motion of flexible robots, but also for the manipulation of cells, for the magnetic guidance, uh, for the delivery of cells and biochemical manipulation of cells. And on the other side, I'm looking at sperm cells, on, and this is more in the, in the field of biophysics, where we look at which factors affect sperm motility. And for that, we need to emulate in vivo conditions to get a better understanding of um, what it really takes for sperm cells to get to the egg, um, and how, for example, physical parameters affect disease sperm migration how the viscoelasticity of the medium plays a role, interaction with surface, but also interaction between the sperm cells. Uh, so yeah, this is the outlook of my Lakaisha project here at EBEC, where we will be developing flexible flagellated robots. First of all, I will investigate uh, cooperative behavior of sperm. So I'm looking at the bundling of sperm, which is seen across many species. And to understand this cooperative behavior, it is more physical or biochemical effect. And what do we do see in preliminary uh, studies is that these, these sperm bundles, so if you have two, three, or five, or even 10 cells, they do swim faster than single sperm under certain conditions. So that's very interesting also for microbotics. So then we will take this knowledge to fabricate multi-flagellated flexible robots. Uh, and in the end, we'll investigate that for 
uh, cell delivery. And there I will give a bit more detail in my flash talk at the ABEX Symposium, which is coming up. And here I will just uh, give you a few, uh, a little bit of an overview of uh, what I've been doing the last few months. So basically, uh, if we want to develop flexible robots, this flexibility of the material is very important and we need to be able to tune this property. And uh, what we did was um, here with the proof of concept, we used a PDMS that was 3D printed by our extrusion printer. And uh, we then used different ratios of the PDMS and different curing temperatures to uh, tune the elastic modulus. This is what you can see here. You can really tune this um, property. And then we sputter these 3D printed filaments with nickel so that we're able to uh, actuate them in our magnetic field. For that, we have this simple setup of four electromagnetic coils that can generate different types of magnetic fields. And uh, we can then use that to, uh, to propel um, these filaments forward. And you can see here this oscillating motion over time. And we look at the influencing factors on this flexible motion that obviously with the frequency uh, of the magnetic field, we can increase the velocity up to a certain point when the filament is not able to follow the magnetic field anymore. Uh, also with increased flexibility, we get increased velocity of the robot and the location of the magnetic segment plays a minor role, but it tends to be the head, uh, when the head is magnetized, it, it gives us a better velocity. And then uh, now we start uh, exploring the potential of these uh, cell delivery machines. Here just with, uh, with the model uh, cell type, in this case, skeletal muscle cells, that uh, we can uh, culture on top of these 3D printed structures, and they can also differentiate into muscle. So the biocompatibility uh, looks quite promising. In the future, I will um, investigate more smart, smart materials for such flexible robots as well. And um, one, one obviously is the NIPAM that we use to create a shape change, but also to, um, to generate this uptake and release that we want for possible cell delivery or for drug delivery. So these are 3D printed NIPAM structures and we just look at the, uh, the shape change, but also we can exploit this for targeted release. And that's another point of interest at the moment that we load um, silica particles into these 3D printed night pump structures at low temperature. And we can see as we increase the temperature that uh, the particles are released during the water expulsion. Up, um, so as I explained earlier, when this hydrogen collapses, the water is expelled and with that also the, the particles. So we do get release of the particles, but this has to be improved because you can see still see that um, about 30% of the particles remains inside the hydrogen structure. And with that, I'd like to end and uh, thank my global and local network. And also thank you guys all for, for listening and for hosting me here at EBEC. And I'm open for questions now. <laughs>